There we go. Okay, I have 602. We're going to get started. Welcome everyone to the Massachusetts Clean Heat Standard virtual community meetings. Um, we'll get through the agenda in a little bit. Um, I want to thank you all for attending and, and welcome you to tonight's meeting. And just mention that we are very pleased to have you all and thank you for your engagement over the length of this process. Um, it's been invaluable to have you here and to hear your comments if you're new. We are um, certainly welcome to any of your comments as well. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Christine Kirby. I am the Assistant Commissioner of MassDEP's Bureau of Air and Waste. And with me tonight are Will Space, Emily Lamb, and Josh Cook from the, the Climate Strategies Group at DEP. So um, we will talk about our schedule going forward as we move forward to the draft regulations for the clean heat standard that we hope to get out by the end of the year. Um, but before we um, get to the agenda for tonight, I would like to turn it over to Emily Lamb for logistics. Emily. Thanks, Christine. Um, so as we mentioned at the start, the meeting is being recorded um, to minimize the background noise. Participants are on mute, and we'd ask that you stay that way during the presentation. Um, and if you need to, you can rename yourself in the participants panel and put in your full name and affiliation. You can do that by clicking on the participants icon and then next to your name, there's an option to rename. On the next slide, I'll talk about opportunities to participate in the meeting. So the latter half of the meeting will be dedicated to questions and comments. Um, so if you'd like to write a comment or ask a question, you can use the raise your hand function which you can find in the bottom right of the participants panel. Um, and when it's your turn, we'll notify you by chat. You can also um, put things in the chat if you'd like to put comments or questions in the chat, but we'd ask that you wait to put things in the chat until we finish the presentation. And with that, I'll hand it back to Christine. Great, thanks, Emily. So um, for the agenda, we've already handled the logistics and updates. And tonight, what we would like to do is after a refresher of the clean heat standard, um, you've all heard it before, but we always want to go through it. It's a complicated and complex policy. Um, after we get through that, we want to review the comments we received um, this fall and winter for um, about 10 minutes of our agenda. And, um, and we'll, I think Emily's going to cover that. And then we want to talk about some program design options that we're thinking about. These are not final decisions. Um, based on our based on our thinking, but also the, the great input that we've received from you. So, um, and then of course we want to wrap up with some some questions and comments at the end that we usually do for these meetings. Next slide, please. I want to cover something here, which is really a review of what we've been doing the last several years. Um, and in a bit, we're going to get to what we're going to be doing, or what we've already done, and what we're going to be doing in 2024. But we wanted to cover what we've, what we've uh, done so far to get to where we are now. So going back to 2021, um, the Clean Heat Commission was formed by an executive order um, 596 in the last administration. Um, and that, that commission did meet. Um, so that happened in, in 2021, well, it met after that too. Moving on to 2022, um, what's known as the Clean Energy and Climate Plan was published for 2025 and 2030. And these were published by EEA with cooperation from many other agencies working under EEA and even outside of EEA and um, with input from stakeholders. So we had the CECP for 2025 and 2030, um, which detailed the, the various policies to get to our climate goals. And then later that fall, the CECP for 2050 was published which to meet the, the uh, the 2050 goals. And at that same time, the Clean Heat Commission report was published. And that really tasked um, DEP to design a clean heat standard, which is what we've been doing. Um, moving on to 2023, we did a number of things. One of the first things we did is we released a discussion document on what the clean heat standard is all about, what it could contain. Um, got lots of comments there and lots of engagement. We also released a heating fuels emissions reporting discussion draft. Um, and then um, later that led to a draft regulation, which you'll hear a little more about later. And that really lays the groundwork for, for getting information from regulated fuel suppliers so that we can design the program 
and um, have a good handle about the fuels that are being used for feeding in the Commonwealth. Um, and we had a, a comment period that had a deadline of May 1st, and then a summer comment deadline in the summer of September 1st. And that led to the um, release of the Clean Heat Standard Draft Program Framework, which is a, 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 a framework on how we envision the program working, very much for comment. We received lots of comments on the various aspects, but we'll get, and we'll get to that. We also released um, what we call a voluntary early registration program discussion draft. And this is for how you could um, apply to get early reduction um, clean heat credits. And we had a, a comment period deadline um, of December 21st of last year. So that's what we've been up to over, over the last three years. And um, again, thank you for your engagement. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Will. With us, Will? It's like maybe Will's having trouble. I could present this slide while we wait for him to come back on. Let's just give it a minute. And if he doesn't come back, we can present that way. That sounds good. Okay. Um, why don't you go ahead, Emily? All right. Um, yeah, so this slide is just providing a reminder of what a uh, clean heat standard is. So it's a regulatory program that would require heating energy suppliers. So the suppliers of heating oil, propane, natural gas, and electricity um, to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions over time. And these heating energy suppliers would demonstrate those emissions by holding clean heat credits. Um, as Christine mentioned, last year we released a draft program framework that sort of lays out our thinking based on the stakeholder input we received of what a clean heat standard would look like in Massachusetts. And it looks like Will's back, so maybe he could take over. I am. I am. Sorry, Sorry about, about that. that. So did, so you, did get, you get through, through this slide? slide? Maybe, I'll, maybe I'll think, think I, heard, I heard. heard. Will, it sounds like big, you have an echo. Big echo. Do I still have an, have an echo? echo? Yes. Um, um, Emily, Emily, I think you might have lost a little bit of a lot of rock, 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 virtual community meetings, one of which is this evening. These are sort of content for a general audience and lots of time for questions and comments. And then at the same time, we've also been holding a different type of meeting that we've been calling technical sessions that go into the sort of details on program design and some of the more technical topics. Um, and I'll just say that all recordings of all these meetings um, and the slides from them are all up on our website. So you can go and watch them if you missed one or, or want to go and revisit them. Um, and at the bottom of this slide, just reemphasizing that we are um, accepting comments or questions at any time into our climate strategies email box. And then I think we can go to the next slide and we'll just talk about some of the resources that we have available for stakeholders. So earlier this year, we kind of um, reorganized our website to hopefully make it a little easier to navigate since there's um, quite a bit of material up there from the various um, things that we've put out over the past year. And we, earlier today, put up some new documents, including um, an updated FAQ document, um, a discussion draft that talks a little bit about crediting for commercial and industrial buildings. And then the comments that we received over the fall and winter, um, and then a summary of the themes from those comments, which is gonna be kind of the focus of uh, some of the first part of this meeting. And I think with that, I can turn it back to Christine for the next slide. Great, thanks, Emily. So I said earlier, um, we would come to where we are now in 2024 after reviewing where we were from 2021 to 2023. So um, this this call this winter, um, on January 5th, we released a draft heating fuels emission reporting regulation. This is built upon 
some of our earlier stakeholder involvement uh, thinking that was released. Um, and the, the comment deadline was February 23rd. And we are now going over the comments received, um, which will ultimately lead to the final regulation, which we hope to get to um, being a final in the fall, as you look over to the right on the chart. We also, in the, this winter, on February 16th, released a voluntary early registration um, document. Um, that's a program where entities can do clean heat early and get early um, early credits. So um, you know, we're looking at those comments too on that that comment. Um, excuse me, that discussion document. Um, and then moving over to the middle column, we have there, um, we release a discussion document on the commercial and industrial heating crediting um, piece of the program. That's a spring, it was actually released already in the winter, but that's out and out for your comment, recently posted. Um, we're also gonna be looking for final writ written comment deadline on our informal stakeholder process. But you'll hear later that we accept comments at any time. Um, so. Um, we're asking for, you know, we, we, we tend to have a date, but we'll, we'll accept comments at any time. Um, and then moving on to this fall, um, again, as I said earlier, we want to finalize our emission reporting regulation. And then um, our ultimate goal is to propose a comprehensive clean heat standard regulation, which will be the program moving forward. Um, and again, it'll be a proposal. We will be taking comments on it. And um, just so folks know, we plan on sending out a stakeholder meeting, excuse me, email next week um, with more detail on our next steps for the spring. So stay tuned for that. And with that, I will turn it over to, I believe, Emily. Let me just, how am I doing now? Good. No idea what happened, but all right, thank you. So I'll take a couple more slides and then turn it over to any, Emily. So the next, next part of the, presentation. Um, we're going to share a little bit about our, our, our comments that we received. And, um, you know, we received a lot of great comments. We put a draft framework out for comment, as, as, as you just heard, in November, at a comment deadline in December. Lots and lots of comments with many themes. Um, and we have always said throughout this process that, you know, our comment process is ongoing, but we are hoping to kind of bring that to a close. We don't necessarily think people need to submit more comments. We we have comments. We 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 you know we'll, we'll still keep looking at all the comments we received. But if you have additional things you want to give us, um, as as Christine I think may have mentioned, we'll send out a, a stakeholder email next week uh, confirming this. But we'd like to try and think about wrapping that up by April fifth. So. Other thing I want to say about the comments is, Emily's. we, we hope it's helpful to you for us to provide summaries of the comments. Um, we also hope you understand that we can't really do justice to the huge range of comments, so we hope it's helpful to share some of the key themes. There's also a document on the website um, with a written summary that has more detail about the comments, and then all the comments are also posted. So I'm going to turn it over to Emily to, to briefly summarize the themes we've heard recently. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to talk about the comments um, sort of organized based around the sections that are in the draft program framework we released last year. So just as a little reminder, um, I'll start with setting the standards, which is sort of the idea of how much um, clean heat we need. Um, the draft framework includes separate standards for full electrification projects, um, including a low income carve out and then an annual requirement for emissions reductions that would be met by actually using clean heat. Um, and on the next slide, we can talk about the comments. So we received comments sort of generally about setting the standard, about the basis that we should use to set the standard or, and the goals that it could aim to achieve. So for example, um, setting a carbon intensity goal for fuels or to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Next, talking about the full electrification standard specifically, we heard comments that support the full electrification requirement, which applies to the residential sector, um, as well as some opposition to that concept um, or questions about the need for it. We also received suggestions to develop a similar full electrification requirement, but for non-residential buildings, so for commercial and industrial uses. Regarding the equity carve-out, 
we received comments um, recommending expanding the scope of the residences that will be eligible to be used to meet that carve out to include moderate income households, um, potentially considering using geographic identifiers um, for large multifamily buildings. And we also received comments about the size of that carve out and how we might want to implement protections for renters or low income customers um, within that carve out. And then finally, on the emissions reduction standard, comments focus mostly on the sort of stringency, so how, how much emissions reductions are needed and then the timing um, of those emissions reductions requirements. So the next section in the framework is about the regulated heating energy suppliers, so which companies would need to comply with the standards. And the draft framework includes annual requirements for electricity, natural gas, heating oil, and propane suppliers. So in terms of the comments for the electricity suppliers, we received comments that focused on the sort of pace. I guess something I should have mentioned on the earlier slide, my apologies, is that the requirements um, start mostly on the um, fuel suppliers and shift over time onto the electricity suppliers as more and more customers electrify. Um, so on the next slide, we received comments about sort of the pace of that shift um, and the methods that we could use to determine sort of the pace and timing of the shift of the obligation onto the electric sector. We also received requests for additional rationale and explanation about why we're including the electric sector as an obligated entity. Um, and closely related to that, um, commenters flagged that raising the price of electricity is counterproductive to incentivizing building electrification. Then on municipal light plants specifically, we, we got some comments that focused kind of specifically on this section of the electric sector. So we got comments questioning MassDEP's legal authority to regulate the MLPs under a clean heat standard. And we also received comments expressing support for including MLPs as obligated entities in the clean heat standard um, if the electricity sector is included. For the delivered fuels, Comments focused on the logistical challenges and technical complexities about um, both regulating these, these companies and that these companies might face in complying with the clean heat standard requirements. So credit generation, we received um, a lot of comment on credit generation and as in our prior rounds of stakeholder feedback, it's an area where there's a lot of um, stakeholder interest. So, the draft framework limits crediting to electrification and liquid biofuels, and then includes a program review in 2028 that would consider um, revising eligibility on a specific set of criteria. And then for the full electrification um, eligibility specifically, that is limited to residences that install electric heat pumps that can meet 100% of their space heating needs. So in terms of the comments, for the full electrification credits, um, we heard differing perspectives on how we should handle um, heat pump systems that retain a fossil fuel backup with some commenters supporting crediting for those and some commenters saying that there shouldn't be any crediting or full electrification crediting for those. Um, we also received comments about requiring other appliances for full electrification crediting, such as heat pump water heaters, induction stoves, or electric dryers. On the emissions reduction crediting, um, the framework included um, a simplifying assumption of defining, of assigning a default five metric tons of emissions reductions per residence for residences that are using um, heat pumps for their heating. And so we got comments that raised concerns about both the concept of assigning a default value per residence, and then about whether five metric tons is the right um, amount of emissions reductions to assign if we did use that kind of simplifying assumption. We also continue to receive comments um, suggesting that the clean heat standard should, should consider the carbon and intensity um, of electricity generation when um, evaluating credit generation for emission reductions. So another area that we received a lot of comments on is um, how MassDEP would, would determine eligibility for generating clean heat credits. Um, so we continued to hear support for a technology neutral clean heat standard, which would be something that would credit anything that reduced emissions. Um, 
as well as um, support for the specific electrification goals that are included in the framework. In general, commenters agreed that life cycle greenhouse gas emissions should be part of what we consider when determining eligibility. Um, and they also identified other metrics or factors that we might want to include in our considerations, um, such as health impacts. We also received comments on the timing and frequency with which we would evaluate fuels and technologies um, for allowing them to generate credits. And then on specific fuels and technologies, um, we continue to receive a lot of comments um, with differing points of views on various inclusion and crediting for various technologies and fuels. So weatherization and energy efficiency, hybrid heating systems, so that's a heat pump with a fossil fuel backup, water heaters and other electric appliances, um, propane and renewable propane, renewable gaseous fuels like RNG and hydrogen, and then other fuels and technologies that we can't fit all of them on the slide, but for example, um, combined heat and power and advanced wood heating. And then finally on credit generation, we also received comments that gave specific feedback on verification measures that we should consider and then questions and recommendations and concerns around CHETS, which is um, the acronym for the Clean Heat and Emissions Tracking System, which would be an online platform that would be used to sort of generate and track the credits themselves. So now this is the last section of the framework is on compliance, flexibility, and revenue. So the framework includes credit banking. It includes an alternative compliance payment option um, with revenue dedicated towards supporting future clean heat projects and a, um, excuse me, a just transition fee concept, which would include a fee on the initial sale of certain credits with the revenue of that fee going specifically to support equitable outcomes. So on the next slide, we received a lot of comments about the alternative compliance payment, um, about the level of, that the ACP would be set at, um, that we put out in the draft framework for the different types of credits and then request for additional quantitative analysis about setting those um, ACP levels. We also received a lot of comments about both how the ACP would be collected and then how the funds should be used. And in general, commenters were supportive of the just transition fee um, concept, but wanted more details about its implementation and how the revenue from that fee would be, would be used. We also received a lot of comments about mass save and potential interactions and alignments with the existing mass save program, um, including aligning with the emissions and equity targets in the mass save um, program, and also comments around the idea of combining or stacking of incentives. There were also a lot of comments that raised concerns about how the clean heat standard would coordinate with existing programs and upcoming state and federal programs. And then finally, we, we received some comments that weren't specifically about aspects of the framework, but we still wanted to you know, summarize them here. Um, so one common theme is economic impacts. We've received a lot of comments about this, um, particularly around the operational affordability of heat pumps um, and ways to financially support customers through the clean heat transition. We also received a lot of comments about the costs of electrification for both existing and new buildings. We're also comments looking at um, suggestions for complementary or alternative policies for the clean heat standards, such as fossil fuel surcharge, um, carbon pricing, a heat pump electric rate, um, or an appliance standard for heat pump water heaters. And then we also noticed some themes in the comments of concerns about the grid's capacity to support electrification and other grid concerns, and then um, comments about the potential impacts on small businesses and the workforce. And so I think with that, I will hand it over to Will. Great, thanks, Emily. So as I said, if you, you know, that's really just to sort of brief you on what we've been hearing about. There's some, there's stuff on our webpage that will give you a lot more detail on the comments we've heard. Um, the, the last section of the presentation here, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some design options that we're sort of looking at um, as we think about moving forward from the framework to a proposed regulation. Before I talk about anything specific, I want to emphasize that 
um, you know, we we are working on um, processing all comments, and we um, are are considering, you know, no no final decisions have been made. So we're picking out a few things here that we're sort of interested in additional comment on. There's a lot of other things where we've already, you know, heard the comment. And we're still still thinking about how to proceed. Um, so I don't want to I don't want to present this as sort of the only changes, but <clears throat> these are some things we were particularly interested in some input on. Um, these are also documented um, in the FAQ um, um, document online. And if you um, have looked at that document, it's getting a little long. So we wanted to get those near the beginning so they'd be easy to get to. So we put them ahead of Q1, which put them as Q0 on the FAQ. So if you go online and open up that document, you'll see a little more information about these, um, these ideas in that document. And particularly if you're going to submit written comments on them, you might want to take a look at that also. Um, we have some ideas about all the different parts of the, the, the standard. Um, and so if you'd move on to the next slide. So we do have some more, a little bit more detailed slides that we could show if we get questions on these, but we have been trying to keep the evening presentations at a little um, less technical and, and more high level updates. So we have this summary slide here. I say that mostly because the slides online you'll find have some more, more detail here in addition to what I mentioned in the Q0 document. So I'm gonna talk through these ideas here and, and you may have questions now or comments or they may think, need things you need to think about a little bit in, as, in terms of the next written comment deadline. So a couple of the ideas we're thinking about relate to the fact that many stakeholders have observed that the, um, the, the clean heat standard as we've framed it only explicitly deals with space heating. It doesn't deal with water heating or other sources of energy. And one of the things we're thinking about doing then is to address some of the numerical um, um, uh, values in the in the framework down a little bit to adjust to that for so for example um, with the uh, um, amount of crediting you would give for a home that went through the full electrification of their heating system we had said you'd give five metric tons which is kind of the average for a home it may make sense to just give something lower like four metric tons to sort of leave room for Kind of water heater accounting if if we want to later or just at least make the accounting of the clean heat standard more um, self consistent. Um, the other thing we've been thinking of, which is a little bit related to this, is that um, we might also want to think about well that that'll lower the overall value of the standard a little bit also. And then related to that, we've been thinking about limiting the time frame over which heat pumps would be credited. So. Remember, for a heat pump, there's sort of two different kinds of crediting. There's this full electrification credit that happens in some cases when a heat pump system is installed, but there's also this ongoing emission reduction crediting. And the way the framework sets that up, you would sort of, if you did your, your if you installed a heat pump, your expectation would be that you would get ongoing emission reduction credits in addition to the full electrification incentive throughout the life of the, the program through 2050. And we think that may be more of a kind of a commitment than we want or need to make to people in that. So we're thinking of, of limiting the crediting period for a heat pump to the first five years of, of operation. And then that would mean that the, the standard wouldn't need to go up once we had phased the program in because some of the heat pumps would become ineligible. So we'd still be covering the same um, amount of emission reductions and heat pumps over the course of the program in this concept. It would just adjust the accounting scheme to be a little more explicit about um, the treatment of water heating and also the um, long-term evolution of the program and make it a little more sustainable. So that's one set of things we're thinking about. Um, we're also thinking about in terms of regulated heating energy suppliers, um, the electric companies have compliance obligations under the clean heat standard um, as it's presented in the framework. And there's been some concerns about, about that. Um, we think that's important in the long term to make sure the program is durable through 2050, but we, we have been more interested in whether um, postponing that um, the applicability of the emission reduction crediting part of the program to 2035 
um, is a helpful way to address stakeholder comments on that issue. Couple things in the credit generation category. One of them is to um, focus our crediting of, of um, um, biofuels more on the waste-based biofuels for things that are not currently in, in use in Massachusetts. Um, we have some fuels in use in Massachusetts that are recognized by EPA and um, California as being lower emissions than fossil fuels. And we um, acknowledge that, but we um, also have a long-term um, tendency and also a, some history on really, really focusing on waste-based biofuels. So what the idea here is for the um, for the, the fuels that aren't waste-based, we would limit the crediting to, um, to not credit blends above B20, which we think is sort of the higher blend that's covering most of the, um, the biofuel in Massachusetts now, and also for renewable diesel, and except for waste-based products. And that would focus any kind of capital investments or really changes in the delivery systems on on the waste-based fuels, but still credit the the, um, the other fuels through 2030, as we've as we've talked about in the framework. Um, also, and somewhat related on the credit generation side, um, we've observed that for the ongoing emission reduction credits for the biofuels, it's the provider of the energy that um, that gets the credit and is in the credit market basically. Um, but for in the framework, the emission reduction credits, not the full, well, the full electrification ones, but the emission reduction ones, um, we might think about instead of them being assigned to the homeowners, assigning them or at least um, have, having a mechanism that helps to assign them to the electricity providers so that the heating energy suppliers would be really the ones that were creating credits in that market. And that's kind of related to the fact that we've talked about. Um, verifying the operation of heat pumps using looking at at the billing patterns and the electric sellers have access to that billing information that they can use to identify um, you know streamline the crediting process so I understand there may be comments on that and we look forward to them but it's an idea we've been thinking about sort of to simplify the administration and maybe make the crediting work more smoothly um, Another option, we hear comments about the just transition fee, which was a idea of collecting some funding for um, projects that help with equity goals from um, the, the first transfer of credits that were not um, um, credited under the low, low income category. And we thought we might, in response to those comments, make that a little bit more targeted so maybe just the largest homes would would result in the payment of that fee or some some other um, geographic identifier or something. So we um, we're interested in comment in that. And then finally, we would just mostly want to make people aware that we're very aware of the need to manage any interactions or or um, um, compatibility issues with the Mass Save program, um, and that applies to the the full electrification crediting program predominantly, but also um, we want to stress also that within the framework, there are parts of it, including the stringency, the ACPs, going back to our earlier discussion document, that we really um, put in the document with reference to the Mass Save program. And so we're, we're always watching the, the three-year plan process and other aspects of Mass Save and talking to our colleagues to think about how to align that. So when we propose the regulation, we may have, have some changes that help with that alignment. So I realize that's a fair amount of new material and I can go into more detail in terms of questions. Um, and also I would just point out that the FAQ includes additional written explanations of some of the explanation I just gave. So if you're thinking of, of written comment, you may want to um, look at that and I'll remember, mind you, that's also, you know, remains a kind of live document where you can you can submit, um, um, you know, comments and questions, and we may be able to add to the FAQ over the next month or so. Next slide, and this is the last one before we take questions. So just to kind of summarize the meeting here, 
as you know, we, we, we went through a comment process on the framework. We got a lot of different comments. We're considering all of those comments and I, I don't, I didn't leave things out because we're not considering them. I just included a few things that were, we're um, looking for additional input on at this point. Um, so we want to emphasize as always that these are not decisions. These are, these are prompts for stakeholder input. So I think we could go ahead to the, the next slide and I think we're ready for questions and comments at this time. And we have a small group, so I think we can, we can dive right into technical issues if people have them. Um, and I think we'll take, you know, raised hands or um, for, to speak or, or written comments in the chat. Uh, Larry, if I ask you to unmute. Uh, thank you, uh, folks at DEP, for uh, working hard on this very important but also complicated uh, program. Um, I have a few comments, um, mainly about Q0, the new questions that you've answered in the new document. To be honest, some I still need to digest, and so I'll probably make comments on those by um, April 5th. Um, the first one would be, would like to see more rationale or, or the math about why you would reduce the uh, annual increase in the reduction standard from uh, five to four uh, by 2030. Um, I wanna make sure that the clean heat standard is commensurate with the requirements of uh, the Global Warming Solutions Act and subsequent uh, amendments to that. And, and I, I, you're by arbitrarily, not by essentially reducing the obligation from five to four, um, you know, that's a big hit. That's 25%. And, and I think you need to uh, show the math to indicate that we would get where we need to be. I also don't accept the logic that that allows headroom by leaving room for residential water heating crediting within the crediting scheme. Uh, that would only make sense if we had a program that adequately incentivized people to switch water heating from fossil fuels to electric uh, at the same time that you start the clean heat standard for heat pumps. So this ties into what I've said before. I think that the standard should support heat pumps, um, uh, network geothermal um, for space heating, um, but also water heating, stoves, and dryers, and also weatherization. Um, all of those are um, absolutely going to reduce emissions, regardless of the initial heating source. Um, and what I'm not quite seeing enough of is, is coordination with the Mass Save program. I, I think you could simplify this a lot if you uh, worked with DOER a little bit on, on that. But essentially, what I would propose is that uh, for heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, stoves, dryers, and weatherization, that the clean heat standard provide credits on a one-time basis at the point of installation, and that it would run through some sort of a partnership with Mass Save so that the um, contractors and the consumers could get their check uh, right at the beginning, and that would um, be all you need, particularly for those other devices. So I'm going to put into the chat in a few minutes an article from the Boston Globe about how the Boston Housing Authority is putting uh, electric stoves in um, some of their units as a pilot program. That's the kind of thing that we could do at scale. I don't think you need to put all your eggs into the heat pump um, basket, even though we have to uh, have heat pumps in every home. I think you can also uh, reduce emissions significantly by adding um, stoves, dryers, and heat pump water heaters. I recently uh, replaced my uh, gas water heater with an uh, electric heat pump water heater. Uh, it was very simple um, and it's eligible for a mass save incentive, but it also, the other concern I have is, it's essentially the incentive for mass save is coming on the back of the electricity rate. And if we're gonna do this at scale, we, we can't, continue to increase the electricity rate that's counterproductive to the whole electrification uh, concept. And so this is a comment I've made before. I don't think we should be making electric um, distribution companies um, um, an obligated entity. Um, another point I guess I would make would be um, 
that you might want to consider moving your program review to 2027 so that you can uh, dovetail your review of the program with the planning process of the three-year plans for the Energy Efficiency Advisory Council on Mass Save, because they're going to they're about they're in the planning process to come up with a new program for 25, 26, 27. I'm a little disappointed that the process for the clean heat standard is not further along because I believe that there are people over at the EAC who don't know enough about how this is playing out. And it's going to be awfully important uh, where the rubber meets the road that what MassAve is doing is, is, is sensible with respect to what you're doing and vice versa. And so I, I'd like to see that come together faster than um, the fall of 2024. Uh, but then again, they'll have a three-year process and yours isn't quite in sync with that. And I, and I think you might want to do that. Um, but otherwise, I will have more comments. I've got to digest some of the things in your questions. And um, I guess I did have a question in the chat I posed. Um, when you reduce the credit generation for a heat pump to five years, previously had 15, um, is it that going to affect essentially the re reward or incentive one would get for having a heat pump over time? In which case, um, I understand the point you're trying to make, which is you don't want to essentially unnecessarily uh, provide uh, credit to something indefinitely through 2050, but you do... Um, and you want to shorten that up, but I think the incentive needs to be, uh, um, I think you should avoid trying to reduce that incentive. So thank you for the time. Sure, and I can provide uh, reactions to at least one of those things, and I'll see if I can remember a couple others. But um, so the um, the heat pump incentive, um, we, well, I'm bad at multi-part questions. Uh, can you just repeat the last one you said? Because I, I did have some, I did have a reaction to that and I lost track of it. Or if somebody else wants to remind me what it was, Emily may have it in here. Looks like Larry's on mute now. Yeah, I'm, I'm muted now. Um, it seems like you've made a change where credit generation for a heat pump is going from 15 years to five years. Yeah, and, okay. and I sort of understand the management idea behind that, but is that going to reduce the amount of uh, reward that someone gets for going to a heat pump by a third over time? Yeah, the, the point I want to make is that we've never really thought that ongoing incentive was the major incentive for like installing a heat pump. It was more intended to deal with this question of are people using them over time once they're installed? That's always why we've had that full electrification part of it, and that wouldn't be affected at all here. So that full electrification standard would still be requiring the same number of heat pumps every year, and this would just basically, um, you know, keep the number of heat pumps constant. But after five years, since some of them wouldn't be earning credits anymore, you um, you you could have additional ones that were earning credits that were coming into the system. We also did put in the in the text of the document that we're open, definitely interested in what the right time frame might be. We don't want to make, we don't want to overcommit here. So if, you know, if, if, if we, we could, if we find that the five years isn't sufficient, increase that, but we might be in a little, we were concerned about what seemed to be a commitment to provide credits over a 25 year period, which seemed a little much. It, so again, to be clear, that's only for partial home electrification uh, in that it, case. It also applies to the full home electrification. Okay. Well, but, my, but so I get, I get your logic now. Um, I guess I would go a step further and simplify it. For full electrification, I would just give one upfront grant, and like the way MassSafe has been doing for a long, long time. And I think it would be easier for everybody. But Right. And the other thing about the program review date, 2026 is kind of the first year of the program. 2027 is the first year of the, when the compliance happens for that year. So that's the reason for 2028. But we aren't, you know, there's no reason we can't look at particular things outside of that schedule. So that's a good point. You know, it's it's something we're very focused on is the overlap and, and interactions with MassSafe. So that's helpful. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Michael Ferrate. 
Why is Mass DEP considering not allowing blends higher than B20 for renewable diesel or crop-based feedstocks when in fact the DEER's Alternative Energy Portfolio Standard Program allows for blends of B10 or higher? What is the science behind allowing waste-based feedstocks but not renewable diesel or crop-based feedstocks? So the, the science behind it is that based on analysis by you know many parties, the overall greenhouse gas emissions life cycle profile and impacts are better for waste-based um, fuels than they are for crop-based fuels. And that's um, you know, those, those, that same analysis is what underlies the um the fuel that's being used in Massachusetts um, as as bioheat is is lower emissions. Um, an, another place that acknowledges that difference is the DOER um, regulations, which are focused on waste-based biofuels and also the draft framework that we put out for comment that um, you know has a focus on waste-based biofuels as the long term after after 2030. And that's consistent with kind of in the clean energy climate plan um, aspects related to advanced biofuels, sometimes people like second generation biofuels. So we're we want to focus on the waste-based biofuels in the long term while still recognizing the um, the fuels that are in, in circulation now. So the thing about the renewable diesel and the above B20 blends is they're not you know, kind of major account, they don't account for a major amount of the um, bioheat that's in the system in New England now at this point in Massachusetts. And they might require some capital type investments, either new ways of, of segregating and getting um, renewable diesel that's from different speed stocks into New England, or um, possibly um, um, changes to combustion equipment. We want to make sure if those um, you know, those things that require um, more than just differing blends are happening. They're focused on the waste-based fuels. So we, we're trying to recognize, and there is a, in the FAQ words we put out, we do recognize the um, fuels that are currently in circulation and, and the, the, the desire to balance that with the long-term focus on waste-based fuels. Stephen Dodge, not clear in the Q&A, will the elimination of the emissions credit for crop-based renewable diesel, any amount, and crop-based bioheat blends above B20 or for crop-based renewable diesel and uh, biodiesel blends over B20? Neither makes sense. Um, I, Josh, can you tell that the clarification question or just a comment? I think I, think I covered that, but Stephen, feel free to speak up if I... Uh, Stephen, I've asked you to unmute. Sure. Yeah. And I'm sorry, Mike. So I'm not clear with the Q&A whether you're talking about the elimination of a credit for all, I guess the simplest way to ask, are you looking at an elimination of a credit for all crop-based renewable diesel uh, or just blends over B20, over R20, I'm sorry. So yeah, I just um, want to just caveat this by saying we are looking, you know, this this is why we're having this meeting and put this out is to get comment on this. Um, we are, the framework already um, is set up to end with a program review to reconsider potentially in 2028 and crediting for the crop-based fuels in 2030. Um, and, and offer, but before that time, offer basically half, half, count, 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 um, give sort of half credit compared to waste-based fuels for the crop-based fuels. In, in the framework, there's no sort of limit to that. So you could have crop-based fuels over the next few years um, going into B100 or renewable diesel. And we're saying that in order to kind of prepare for that transition to waste-based fuels, we want to see um, anything that's, that's coming in um, um, that's in those higher blends or those new technologies is has a waste-based um, origin. Does that help? And, and again, we are open for comment on this, so we can we can certainly just just have you tell us what you 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 have your thoughts. But yeah, so I'm if you don't mind me just following up quickly. Sure. Uh, so I'm I'm still not clear of what the role. I mean, I I understand your issues with crop-based versus waste-based. Uh, biomass-based diesel, I'm not quite sure what you're differentiating between RD and BD, but we can talk about that 
more later. Um, but I'm I'm just as kind of an overall comment. Um, we really need it all to make this program work. Um, and I think that's been what we've seen in states that have low carbon fuel type programs like California, Washington, Oregon, and soon New Mexico. Um, granted, that's on the transportation side, but we're talking about tremendous volumes. And and those programs let the market figure it out, uh, which is the most viable, cost effective, affordable, biomass eligible biomass based fuel. And I think the Massachusetts program uh, should do that as well. If you want to assign different values, like you proposed before, uh, you know we can talk about that. But it's still a reduction. Yeah, it may be less of a reduction, but it's still a reduction. And um, I, I think we all agree that the ultimate goal of this program. Uh, which is laudable, is to reduce carbon emissions in the short term. So in order to do that, I mean, you're looking at long term as well, but in the short term, it's most important right now. And so it makes sense to allow all eligible pathways. And and we will submit written comments. Um, I just don't see yet uh, a, a science-based argument for that differentiation. And it's kind of like saying... I'm not going to buy new shoes for my kids because they're going to outgrow them in the year. It, it just doesn't make sense. And and on the in the back to the Q and A for a minute, you reference, you know, and you just reference as well that you know higher blends renewable diesel are not. I think you're missing a word in the Q and A available, which is not the case, and could require investments in equipment adjustments, new transportation and storage pathways. Well, the beauty about RD is that it doesn't require substantial investments, if any at all in equipment adjustments, new transportation or storage pathways, because it is a 100% drop in fuel. So anyway, I, I hope um, the department revisits that proposal and we'll certainly be submitting comments and appreciate the opportunity to offer the comments. Yeah, I think, and also hearing more about the renewable diesel pathway would be something we'd be happy to hear about. There is a challenge there, as you know, renewable diesel is, uh, um, you know, is chemically identical or very close to the fossil diesel. So there's a need to have a segregated, you know, process for, for keeping the fuel separate. And I know that that's, you know, something that can be done. Um, but I think the, the, you know, potential for doing that, um, you know, is, is something we'd be interested in hearing more about. Uh, Laura Dubister, I've asked you to unmute. Very good. Thank you. Um, this is my first up uh, my first uh, I'm new to this whole conversation and I'm pretty much a lay person at this point. And I would say I understood about 25 percent at most of the whole presentation. But um, I do have a past uh, professional life in this, but it's just move. I've been retired for about 10 years, so I'm trying to understand it just because I want to understand it. Um, so maybe you should have a workshop for um, clean heat standard for dummies at some point where you kind of go over again, sort of the, the basics and the purpose. I think where I'm, I'm just, and I've already received actually a postcard or a letter from a, a fuel dealer. I think it was an oil dealer or a propane dealer saying this is coming down the road and they're going to make you choose a fuel and this isn't right and call your legislator. So there's already, you know, there's some pushback. I don't know what's, you know, I don't know if that if that's important or not important. I just want to say that I, I've noticed that already. But my question is, and you might have done this before, is kind of put into a um, maybe it's sort of the slide or the flow chart. Like, OK, this is how a credit like I don't know what a credit is. Is it market based? Is there are there a certain number issued like um, with the uh, greenhouse gas emissions where you buy them and they're issued? In a, is it an auction? Is it a price set? Is is the idea that someone pays for it and then that revenue goes to 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 more incentives? I mean, there's ne I don't know where where that's all laid out, but it would be really helpful to see something from all those different perspectives. This is what a customer would see. This is how how a dealer would see it. This is what a regulator would look. You know, where it's kind of not just something more along those lines. Yeah, that's helpful. So I think. Um... Solving addressing this fully is might be a little beyond the scope of this evening, but we do appreciate your your participating. This is exactly the kind of thing we're hoping to facilitate. I guess I would say that we do have a um, 
a, a, a web page for the program that has a, a, a number of YouTube recording of meetings just like this, some of them were, which are very much focused at um, explaining the concept at sort of different levels. And we also have an FAQ document posted on our web page that has some questions about what does this mean for homeowners? What does this mean for different members of the market? Um, I think so. I, I think it's going to be a little tough to 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 revisit all that right now. I, I guess I will say that the, the to answer some of your most basic questions, though, I think the the simplest way to think about it is is to say that there's some similarity to what's done now with solar rooftops, where there's a renewable portfolio standard that sets a standard for certain energy suppliers to buy credits, and that has creates an incentive for people to put um solar panels on their roofs and it's a it's a similar sort of concept it has a number of differences that are unique to what we're working on on uh, now um but but that might be a, a starting point for you to think about it so i hope that may be a little helpful christine i don't know if you have anything to weigh in and we could spend more time on that but i, I don't know if we can, can uh, so you're, you're you're basically saying i need to go to the website and find out all the information and figure it out for myself is that kind of no, what you're not, we're not saying that at all we're just we're just okay. referring to the materials i mean i know this, i know this isn't the time that you're not going to have the time i'm just saying that it's you know i think there needs to be something that kind of wraps it up and and or i mean even just to say what the purpose of the program is i mean yeah. that's that wasn't even part of the introduction Yep. So um, this is, a, as, as you said, this is a series of meetings and we're happy to provide um, the information. A lot of it is up on our website, but on the, you, you started with the money flow issue. And I, I think that's important because we got a similar question earlier today at a meeting at 3 p.m. So let us take that back. I think it is a really important question about how the credit it hap crediting happens, how money flows and whatnot. But we, we have spent a lot of time thinking about on how to explain this and we we, we posted a video and lots of uh, information okay. to, to explain it so um, okay you can let yeah. me know where exactly that video that would be helpful sure yeah i think we could send you some some links around we can probably make sure to get your josh we'd have her contact information anyway right yeah laura with your permission we can send an email to the that would be really helpful. I just want to, I want to understand it because this is, um, you know, I spent 30 years working on this and this is, and this is new and I want to feel comfortable as other people ask me questions because I'm a person that people come to locally. Yeah, I'm more happy to help you. So thank you. Okay. Uh, we have some back and forth in the chat on debating the merits of biofuels, which may not be best debated at this meeting. Christine, I, I kind of agree with Josh's take on that. I don't know what you think about maybe trying to wrap uh, things up. I actually think we've answered a lot of the questions on the, the biofuels issue. If there's any new questions, we can turn to that. But I, I think I do see the, the back and forth. And um, and we'll, I'll reiterate what Will said Please, please uh, send us comments, and we're happy to hear from you on this issue. It's, it's we have not made final decisions. And, and also questions. We're, we're you're welcome to send us questions at any time, and we can consider even posting responses in the FAQ if they're of general interest over the next month or so. So this isn't your last chance to to pose questions. Uh, I'm not seeing any additional uh, comments or raised hands at this time. Okay, let's give it another minute to see if we can get any more. I'm gonna make sure I'm cover everything. Uh, Scott, I've asked you to unmute. Uh, Scott Greenbaum. Um, Professional engineer in the building science end of this this uh, question. Um, a couple of comments. First, depending on renewable sources of biofuels like 
renewable natural gas, propane and stuff. I developed a number of these projects. There's not a, a lot of them available. Um, we tried to develop a project for the city of Baltimore's wastewater treatment plant with a biodigester on it. We could run a 2000 kilowatt generator off that. And the fuel was biogas, 500. We couldn't afford to convert it to methane to put it into the system. Um, we've done a lot of, I did a lot of work on looking at bringing uh, uh, um, landfills. Landfill gas, again, is about 500 BTU per cubic foot product. And again, the amount of stuff that you can, you know, map, the size of the generators are pretty small and they run out of fuel after 20 years or so, the, the production drops, starts to drop off of, like a, uh, a rock. So using biofuels, these type of fuels for heating houses and buildings just doesn't make any sense. We need to use this, these fuels for important, for high end thermal needs, such as running cars, trucks, to use them in manufacturing, biochemistry and stuff. So we shouldn't be having a renewable standard that we're trying to use them there. The same thing with hydrogen. Hydrogen is gonna be very rare. It can be made. We've known how to make it for a long time with renewable electric with electricity and stuff, but there aren't a lot of plants and there are not gonna be a lot of plants online by 2040, 2045. I mean, it's a big buildup to build stuff that will do anything near the capacity that we need to heat the buildings in this in Massachusetts, much less the nation. And uh, we need again to use this stuff for much higher, you know, thermal needs, which is running big trucks and in the industries and stuff. Uh, my clients keep on getting um, things from vicinity that their new e-steam is a great idea for this standard and that it's been accepted. But um, I think we've um, ignored a couple of questions. One is over a third of their energy that they put in their 26 miles of pipe doesn't never gets anywhere, doesn't get in the buildings. There's no condensate return and 20% of the steam condenses before it gets to the meters. So that means that we're gonna have a system that you're gonna be making steam out of electricity and throwing 30% of it away. That's gonna put an enormous strain on a grid that is already strained, and it's gonna um, take renewable energy that we produce, and it, you know we're not gonna get that much renewable energy by 2050 if we're gonna be throwing 30% of it away. Um, and they're claiming that they can do a heat pump that can take the Charles River from 20 degree, 25 degrees in the middle of the winter and make 370 degree steam at a 2.3 COP. I'm an engineer, that, that, that's pushing it. The best I've seen is somewhere in England where they put some heat pumps in for a district hot water system at 100, and they, it's 193, that's what they run in Europe and they get a TCOP of two. So depending on a technology that hasn't existed, doesn't exist now to make things happen, I just don't see, it's not proven. So I'm gonna have a straight electric um, boiler making steam that 30% of it's gonna be thrown away before I guess I'm, that just doesn't make sense to me. I think we need to look at the science much more closely. We can't depend on the people who are gonna make the money on this to tell us what, their tech, what they can do. We need to go to real experts, go to the 
Lawrence Berkeley Labs, go to the what is it, Pacific uh, Lab, and 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 really talk to engineers and scientists, not talking to vicinity who has some dreams. And they say they're going to buy electricity at night and it'll be free from the grid. But there's 35 megawatts, no, gigawatts of battery storage that is going to also want to buy electricity at the same time. Two of them can't be you know, free. So, you know, I just think that we need to use more science in this thing. You're depending on the utilities, Eversource, National Grid to tell you that what, uh, what the renewable standard is going to be. Get the people that how not have a stake in the answer to to give you answers because you're not you're you're going you're set going down avenues that oh. are going to fail you. So we like, haven't we're not we haven't gone down those avenues yet. So, but we appreciate your comments. I think they're really helpful. So like if, if, from what yeah. I take, yeah, I think your issues are like matters of scale and making sure that we choose the right fuels for crediting. Yeah, and if I can just add as a point of yeah. clarification, the drop framework doesn't have any crediting at this point of the program startup for purchase steam or combined heat and power. We've identified combined heat and power as one of the sources that we do have more thinking to do before it might be credited. So it wouldn't be, it's, it's, it's in our list of things that we might include in 2028. So we accept, I think we understand your comment. We appreciate it. And we, 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 we have work to do on that topic for sure. But then you need to get vicinity to start adver stop advertising that their e steam is in your credit system. That that's helpful to know. We'll we'll take that as a comment. Thank you. Yeah, I think we should move on. Do do we have others that wanted to? Uh, not that I'm seeing. No. Okay, so I think um, we're going to wrap up. We see a slide here about the comment deadline at five and our. Climate Strategies email for comments. And as we've talked about, we take, we're take we taking comments at any time, but we're particularly interested in comments by April 5th on some of the new documents that have been posted. Um, and with that, I wanna thank everybody for engaging in this process. It's been invaluable to have um, these series of meetings to hear from you all and um, appreciate your time and commitment to giving us your comments and submitting, submitting, not only talking to us at these meetings, but also submitting written comments. It's been, again, very, very helpful. And with that, I think we will uh, close for tonight. And thank you for attending. Appreciate it.